it's, this week is a, a time for us to reflect and uh, Rick's asked me to speak on pastoral theology uh, and pastoral ministry and look at some particulars. And if you've had a look at the, uh, the program, you'll see the various topics we're going to do. And we're doing marriage after morning tea, aren't we, don't we, with um, uh, ACL guys. Great to have David here too. And uh, so that's, uh, that's the program we're going to do. And so I start off, like, we start off with um, a theology of pastoral ministry. Uh, the word pastor is normally a word that people perhaps associate with Baptist Church uh, rather than the Anglican Church, although the word pastor actually occurs in the ordinal uh, as it does in the New Testament. Uh, the word pastor, of course, is, uh, comes, is a Latin word for shepherd. And so the concept of pastor is the concept of shepherd. So... Uh, In English language, the word pastoral, uh, used in secular terms, is often a rural term in terms of herding herding sheep. Uh, So the word shepherd itself is a sheep herder, uh, one who gathers sheep. Uh, My guess is, uh, you'd know this better than I, but since I'm a city boy, uh, we probably don't use the word shepherd much in, uh, in rural Australia. Is that right? Is that correct? Um, now it's you, you use guys on motorbikes to herd sheep and, uh, and dogs and, uh, and helicopters in some, in some cases too from what I've seen. Uh, and of course we shouldn't be looking at the word shepherd from an Australian point of view but from a, uh, a biblical world view, not only from the first century but, uh, but also from the, uh, uh, from the Old Testament. And the first thing to note is that the, language, the, the, the concept of shepherd uh, implies the concept of sheep, uh, obviously. And so, therefore, that shepherd-sheep distinction is a, a regular reflection of God's description of his relationship to his people, to his flock. So Israel is described as a flock. Uh, God himself is a shepherd And the concept of being a shepherd is actually being a ruler. Because if the the one who's going to herd the sheep uh, is there, then that's because the herder is the one in control. Uh, You've heard the description of, you know, being a a minister, organising volunteers is like herding cats. Uh, Cats are much more resistant to being uh, herded than uh, than sheep. Uh, Sheep, of course... Uh, on my, my minimal acquaintance with sheep, they're pretty stupid animals. Um, I, I remember when I was in, uh, in, in America and uh, staying with a friend up in Vermont and uh, he, had a friend, he had a friend who was a, he wanted to get some, the sheep from one paddock into another paddock. The paddock where they were in was all sort of uh, you know, dusty and dirty and the paddock where they were, he wanted to put them was beautiful, green, verdant pasture and if only the sheep had known that. Uh, we were trying to gather the sheep the same way you try to gather starlings. Uh, and um, although we were, we were trying to run and catch them and chase them, and of course they'd run around the other part of the side of the paddock, we, we eventually had to sort of corral them with a the truck and, and pick them up one by one and put them in this truck, because they, they wouldn't go voluntarily because we weren't very good shepherds, obviously. And, um, and once we got there... Then, of course, they were as happy as can be as they found this green pasture. It's been a great image for me when, when you're pastoring people is that if only they knew the good things that God has for them and their resistance and they run away and they're pretty stupid animals. And, and I'm not at all surprised that God's used the sheep. Uh, it's not the most intelligent animal that God has created uh, to describe us because we are foolish and want to go our own way and scared and we run off with the other sheep uh, rather than coming to the shepherd. God himself uh, is the shepherd. So if I read from um, Isaiah chapter 40 verse 10, Behold, the Lord God comes with might and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms and he will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. Uh, 
There is a, a great image, a bit like that um, steel hand and a velvet glove. Here is the Lord or God, uh, the Lord God, ruling with justice, with a strong arm, but gently feeding the flock like a shepherd, gathering the lambs in his arms. Uh, God himself is the shepherd. That's one of the uh, descriptors of God. And for us, to, before we get to understanding pastoral ministry, we need to understand what it is that is characteristic of God. Because as image bearers of God, we are reflecting God's character, and particularly in this level of, of leadership. God himself is a shepherd. In, in, Psalm, in Psalm 80, Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock. You who are enthroned upon the cherubim, shine forth. Uh, there, the, there you have the image of God shepherding from his throne. And the throne, of course, is the image with regard to God's rule. And you'll notice that, that God is in, in described as enthroned upon the cherubim. Uh, the cherubim are particular angels uh, which are throne attendant angels. Uh, they're not your ordinary old seraphim, for example. Uh, cherubim in the, in, the, in the scriptures have a very significant place. You recall the first reference to the cherubim uh, when God places the flaming sword at the, at the door of the Garden of Eden, the gateway, as he expels Adam and Eve, and he puts cherubim there. Why? Because this is God's holy garden. This is God's throne room, as it were, on earth pictured in this way, and therefore the cherubim, as the throne attendant angels, are there. The book of Hebrews describes the cherubim as cherubim of glory. It's cherubim which are over the Ark of the Covenant. So whenever you see cherubim, don't just think of those, um, Saint, those Valentine Day's cherubs, uh, but think in terms of throne attendant angels who are guarding the throne and ministering to God and exercising his rule on his behalf. God is the shepherd of Israel as he sits upon his throne. Yahweh is, uh, is present among his people. Uh, so you get the same in um, Psalm 95 where uh, uh, familiar words uh, for, for those who do morning prayer regularly. Um, Come let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker. For he is our God. We are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. We are, we are the ones who actually are benefiting from God's feeding us. And the shepherd is not just, he's, he's there, as it were, to control the sheep, but to guide the sheep, to feed the sheep, to tend the flock, and to provide streams of living water, and food, and, and fresh uh, uh, opportunities to, to, to be fed by him, there the sheep are entirely dependent upon the shepherd. And the image of, of shepherd and sheep, of course, is one which, is, uh, which comes through into the, our, our Lord's words in, uh, uh, in John chapter 10. Uh, Israel's leaders are often described as shepherds too. Uh, you'll see this in 2 Samuel 5, 2 and uh, Psalm 78, uh, verse 70. There you've got the reference to David as shepherd. And um, in, in that verse, you've got, He chose David his servant and took him from the sheepfolds, from tending the ewes that had young, he brought him to be the shepherd of Jacob, his people, of Israel, his inheritance. So David becomes, if you like, the quintessential shepherd. And David the king is the, is the shepherd king. And that language of shepherd there is not, is not as it were, uh, an, a, a, an image of, of weakness or domesticity, but an image of rule. And that's uh, the, 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 the language shift we have to get in our minds, that the word shepherd comes with a sense of authority, of rule, but of care. And it's the combination of God who rules us is the one who cares for us. And he provides for us the very means whereby we might grow. Uh, Joshua, uh, some of the judges are referred to as shepherds, the nobility and Jeremiah too. So uh, you have all these the images of shepherd coming from God is then used collectively not just of David the king, 
but of other rulers and leaders in Israel. And of course Ezekiel's well-known condemnation in chapter 34, where the shepherds are not exercising the, the, the uh, ministry that God has given them, but rather they're false shepherds, they're evil shepherds. So in Psalm 34, those familiar words, the word of the Lord came to me, from Ezekiel 34, sorry, son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, even to the shepherds. Hence the significance of, of this, this uh, prophecy. Thus says the Lord God, ho, shepherds of Israel, who have been feeding yourselves, should not shepherds feed the sheep. You eat the fat, you clothe yourselves with, with wool, you slaughter the fatlings, but you do not feed the sheep. The weak you have not strengthened, the sick you have not healed, the crippled you have not bound up, the strayed you have not brought back, the lost you have not sought, and with force and harshness you have ruled them. So they were scattered because there were no shepherds and they became food for all the wild beasts. My sheep were scattered. They wandered over all the mountains on every high hill. My sheep were scattered over all the face of the earth with none to search or seek for them. And then on he goes there, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against the shepherds. I'll require uh, my sheep at their hand and put a stop to their feeding the sheep. No longer shall shepherds feed themselves. I will rescue my sheep from the mouths, from their mouths, that they may not feed on them. For thus says the Lord God, I myself will search for my sheep and I will seek them out. Behold, I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep. The delegation that God has given to his image bearers in the leadership of, of the structure of Israel was that they should be, as it were, under shepherds. But when they cast that ministry aside and sought to just please themselves and feed themselves, so the condemnation of Ezekiel 34, which then feeds into uh, the language of, um, of John 10. But Ezekiel sets us up for God himself being the shepherd. So that in um, chapter 37 of Ezekiel, in uh, verse 24, uh, we, we see here, I'll pick it up from verse 22, Thus says the Lord God, It is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have proclaimed among the nations to which you came. And I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned among them, and I will vindicate them before their eyes. For I will take you from the nations and bring you from the countries and bring... Yes, no wonder I wasn't finding where it was going. I'm in the wrong chapter. Verse 30, chapter 37, verse 24. I thought I was going to get better. This is better. My servant David shall be the king over them, and they shall all have one shepherd. They shall follow my ordinances and be careful to observe my statutes. They shall dwell on the land and my dwelling place shall be with them, for I am the Lord their God, and they are my people. There you have the issue, the, the foretelling of the new covenant uh, in Ezekiel's language, where God himself will be the shepherd, and he uses the language of David, long after David's died, of course, as a Davidic a messianic signature for the coming of Jesus. And so the whole language in chapter, in chapter 10 of, uh, of John's Gospel brings us to Jesus as the shepherd. But before I explore that, I want to turn with you to Psalm 23, uh, which of course is a well-known psalm, and just reflect upon firstly the understanding of shepherding uh, from this psalm. Psalm 23 uh, is a regularly used psalm at funerals. Uh, it was the first psalm that I taught my own daughters to learn off by heart. And it's a great psalm to actually know off by heart. If Scripture memorization is something which uh, seems to be in demise uh, in our church and I think it, it, it uh, is ready for revival. Uh, 
And uh, if you're particularly in terms of teaching with uh, young, young ones for children, uh, children's capacity to learn and to memorise is far greater uh, than, than we who are adults. Once you turn 18, so I'm told, our, gra- our brain cells start to uh, disintegrate and they're not as active as they, as they have been. And uh, we're having less and less as the days go by, which becomes more and more obvious to people around us, uh, if, even if not to ourselves. Uh, but scripture memorization is, is, a, is a great tool. It was the only tool for illiterate Israel, was scripture memorization. Uh, Psalm 1 talks about a meditating upon the word of God. And that meditation was actually involved in terms of, the the word meditation in the Hebrew is an onomatopoeic word of sort of mumbling, murmuring. And uh, that that sense which you're you're mumbling the words, you're reciting them, you're bringing them to memory in your meditation. And Christian meditation is a reflection upon the word of God and taking it into your heart so that in Spurgeon's words, your blood becomes bibline and that it, it, it uh, feeds your whole body, and the Word of God is actually uh, the, the very means but which animates you and enables you through the Spirit of God to walk in God's ways. Well, Psalm 23. Uh, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Uh, there, there are three stanzas in this psalm, uh, the first two of the three verses being the first stanza. Uh, we very quickly go to uh, Jesus is my shepherd. Even Augustine uh, did that. Uh, and we, 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 in my view, too quickly go to Jesus is my shepherd, uh, which of course is a, a great end goal to get to. But we need to reflect firstly upon David as the sheep and God as the shepherd. And in this first uh, episode, you'll notice that what the shepherd does is provide for his servant, for, for the sheep of David. It's a, it's a picture here of good life. It, it's a picture of um, uh, no lack, no want. It's a picture of still waters, of uh, refreshment for the soul. It's a picture of the sheep walking in paths of righteousness uh, for his name's sake. It's a picture here of David's enjoying the goodness of God. That's, that's how the psalm begins. The second stanza takes us into dark waters or dark valleys. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. In David's experience, he had many dark valleys to walk through. It's as if here we've gone from the good of the first three verses to the evil of the next stanza, of uh, of the next verse. And that evil is the evil which oppresses him. Uh, you can think in terms of David's life uh, in the history of, um, of uh, uh, 1 and 2 Samuel and a little bit, a little bit into 1 Kings, as we heard this morning, uh, where David has to run. He's anointed king by Samuel and yet it's 38 years before he gets to the throne. That's a long time in waiting. Uh, and he... Prince Charles understands that um, uh, in terms of waiting for, to become king. Uh, but that sense in which, and then he has a 40-year reign, uh, as we see. But he's running away from Saul. He, he goes among the Philistines in, and acts like a madman. He has all kinds of um, uh, experiences where he is under threat of death. And he sees the evil around him and what he's saying, so what he says here is that even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. Yes, he knows evil is there, but he's not going to fear it. You can remember some of the episodes in David's life 
where remember that the time when he goes and cuts the, the, the corner of the skirt of, uh, of Saul off uh, in the cave. Uh, and it's very interesting, if you go to Israel today, you can actually see the valley between the cave where uh, Saul would have, would have been and across the valley where David's shouting out to him. Remember that time where Saul, you know, they have a conversation and you wonder, well, why doesn't Saul just go and get him? Well, there's a, there's a deep valley between these two points. And there is David honouring the promise of God that because Saul is the anointed king, he's not going to take the life of the anointed king. But Saul is about to kill him and he's seeking his life. Apart from a few spears at him when he was um, playing the harp, uh, when he was uh, in, in, in kind of good favour, before an evil spirit took over Saul, David knows what evil is like. And therefore, in that context, he trusts the shepherd. That the shepherd is actually guiding him even through the valley of the shadow of death. But then, the final stanza uh, from verses five and six brings us out of the valley of the shadow of death into what we might call the best or the better. So we've got the good, the evil and the better. And what we've got here is you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. There is, if you like, that eschatology for David in terms of bringing him out of this valley of the shadow of death, where in terms of his kingship, not even as his kingship, even till his dying days, there was still rebellion from his sons, as we saw with Adonijah and previously with Absalom, uh, with regard to threats to his kingship. But he sees as he comes to the presence of God in the temple, there he knows he's going to dwell there, in the presence of my enemies, that is, my enemies will be defeated. And the presence of my enemies, that they will witness the vindication of, uh, of King David. In the history of Israel, you actually see this uh, in terms of uh, the, the, the good, uh, the evil, and the, um, uh, and, and the better. You can, you can see it in the history of the family of Israel with regard to uh, the good being in, in the land with Abraham and his sons and then the evil being in Egypt and then coming out through Egypt into the promised land. There is a scenario with regard to that. You can see the same scenario uh, in later Israel's history under King David. There's the good and then they go into exile there is the valley of the shadow of death and they're looking for restoration to the return of the land. So you see this dynamic coming through in the history of Israel. On a more and a broader perspective, you can see it in terms of Eden, in terms of the good, the evil, it took place in terms of the, the fall and then the final consummation. So there's a, a rhythm and a pattern here that Psalm 23 has which engages God's shepherding of his people. Now, the next step to understand the psalm is, is to think in terms of David's greater son. And this is a step that I don't think I've really done much with beforehand. But think in terms of this as a messianic psalm, as indeed we've got 150 messianic psalms, because they're all Christ-centred, that Jesus comes to earth and the Lord is his shepherd. So Jesus is under the authority of his Father and as he comes, he in his humanity experiences in fullness and in perfection the feeding of God's good hand. So you have for him, of course, uh, he, doesn't, he, he doesn't lack. He's fed beside still waters. He lives his life as a young man, as a child, we see that in his going to the, to the temple. God's protection of him, him, him from Bethlehem, from Herod, and uh, movement into Egypt and then back into the land. He's growing up and then he moves into the valley of the shadow of death. In his public ministry and of course seen particularly in his crucifixion and his passion, 
Jesus is, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. And here is Jesus actually encountering the fulfilment of this psalm where though all will desert me on the cross, I am not alone. My Father is with me. And uh, we sometimes sing and sometimes uh, some, some songs I think perhaps aren't as good as they could be at this level. And sometimes in our own, in our own um, evangelical la- language, we talk about uh, Jesus being abandoned by the Father on the cross and talk even the language of being separated from the Father on the cross. Uh, that, uh, may I humbly su- uh, suggest, is a misreading of this text of Scripture. It's a misreading of what it means to be forsaken. The forsakenness of Jesus on the cross is not the abandonment of the Father, but rather is the, the, the Father's description of the Son as his beloved continues right to the end of his life on that cross. But the beloved becomes the accursed. And that is the mystery of the relationship between the Father and the Son. That he who knew no sin became sin for us. But don't think that Jesus is separated from his Father on the cross. Uh, A couple of things uh, inform us of that. The the verse in John 16 uh, that I quoted uh, with regard to I am not alone, the Father is with me, as he he pictures himself going to the cross, as he recognises what's going to take place, the disciples are going to abandon him and leave him. Yes, they will separate themselves from him, but he has the Father with him. It also uh, feeds into the language of the language of hell. As you know, Jesus experiences hell on the cross. Uh, There is no movement of Jesus to hell after the cross, Uh, despite some people's misunderstanding of 1 Peter 3. um, It is not that Jesus moves into, into hell. When Jesus says, it is finished, he didn't mean to be continued. Uh, it was finished. And into, into the Father's hands he commends his spirit. And there, of course, Jesus experiences the separation, the bifurcation of body and soul in his humanity, which we too will experience in our death, lest the Lord come before we die. Um, and Jesus experiences that, but his spirit goes to be with the Father, as does the spirit of the repentant thief on the cross. Hell for Jesus, is experienced in that three hours on the cross when darkness covers the land. And the the experience of hell for Jesus is not just in terms of the physical pain of crucifixion, obviously, but the pain of bearing the sins of his people on the cross. Hell is not, again, if I can challenge our normal language, uh, hell is not the place where God is no longer present. Hell is the place where God is present in judgment. God is omnipresent. You see this particularly in um, in uh, Genesis three, when after Cain has killed uh, Genesis four, sorry, after Cain has killed Abel, what happens? Cain is cast out from the presence of the Lord. Very interesting phrase, isn't it? What does it mean to be cast out from the presence of the Lord? Well, the Hebrew for presence is panim, which means face. So what's happening to Cain? It's not that Cain is sent into a part of the world where God is absent. Rather, Cain has moved into a part of the world where God's blessing is no longer present. So we 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 use it in our English language, don't we? We say, he turned his face away from me. Or if he, he turned his back on me. Uh, the person hasn't disappeared from sight, but his favour is no longer towards you. You've experienced that in functions, haven't you, when people turn away from you in disgust or turn their back on you. And that's the language of the 
favour of God is there. So that verse in, um, in uh, 2 Thessalonians, which is sometimes used to support the view of uh, being separated from the presence of God, that's a reference to the presence of God's blessing. And you only understand that when you've understood the language of the presence of God in the Old Testament and, and the New Testament accordingly. So therefore, hell is not the place where God is absent. No, God is very much present. And that explains why um, in Revelation you have that verse with regard to they will be uh, they will be do you want to open the doors now or not? Or just I'm ignoring him. Uh, that hell is a place in the in the where judgment takes place in the presence of the Lamb. It's a very powerful verse in the, in the presence of the Lamb. So therefore, we need to recognise the reason why hell is so hellish is because God is there with covenant sword of judgement. It's not as if it's some lovely place where you know people just get together with their friends and God's not there so everything will be alright. No, God is there and he's exercising his judgement. And God is present with Jesus both in love and in cursing on the cross. And that's the mystery with regard to But, as Jesus experiences both the first and second stanzas of Psalm 23, so the third stanza is there, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. And God's vindication of Jesus at the final day, at resurrection, is that he defeats Satan in the presence of my enemies, although there's a a time, of course, where in this period of time when the, the final destruction of Satan is yet to take place, but Jesus is exalted and in the presence of God and the dwelling place of the Lord uh, forever. So there is, that, there is that description of the psalm as it finds its fulfilment in Jesus. But then what Jesus does in John chapter 10 is pick up this language where he himself has been the shepherd under the, the, the sorry, the sheep under the shepherd of, of his father he then speaks of his being uh, the, the shepherd, his being the door. So you, you come here in, um, in John chapter 10 uh, with regard to uh, verse 1, I say to you, he does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs in by another way, is a thief and a robber. But the one who enters by the door uh, uh, is, is the shepherd of the sheep. And to him the gatekeeper opens. And the sheep hear my, um, and he knows the sheep by name and leads them out. And they, and they know my voice. They don't know the voice of a stranger. For I am the door. I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. So what, what happens is that in the context of David's flawed shepherding of Israel, being the one who'd been called by God to shepherd Israel, Uh, a flawed shepherding, although a man with a repentant heart and restored by by God in the course of Psalm uh, 23, is looking forward to, to, uh, to restore the true shepherding of God's people, but to do that through the coming of the Christ. So that Christ actually experiences that in his humanity, that sheep-like activity under the shepherd of his father in order that he might enable us as shepherds of the sheep to fulfil the responsibilities that he, is, that he has given to us. So in the New Testament, uh, the language of shepherd is not a language which is used of all Christians. It's a language which is used of the leaders of God's people. And here, whatever polity churches might have, whether it's uh, bishops, priests and deacons, or whether it's uh, elders and, uh, and deacons or, or, or pastors, whatever it might be, uh, the leaders of God's people are seen as shepherds. But we are always exercising our shepherding under the chief shepherd, uh, the true shepherd, uh, the good shepherd. And here, of course, 
uh, whether you think in terms of Christ as a good shepherd but, or as God being the good shepherd, because in a sense what the Lord Christ has become as humanity both Lord and Christ and therefore all that the, the Father has belongs to the Son in his humanity, obviously always in his divinity, in order that we might see him as our shepherd. But our responsibilities now are to pastor the sheep and our image is not so much David, but Christ. And the, the transition from seeing from David through into Christ is to see here we have the sinless, perfect exemplar of what it means to be both sheep and shepherd. And so Jesus now, as he calls us to be his sheep, he calls us to those whom he's gifted with the uh, the anointing of, of leadership to be his under shepherds and to exercise that ministry to his people. So pastoral ministry is all about being a shepherd and it's all about being Christ-like in our shepherding. The main characteristic of the shepherd is to feed the sheep, to care for the sheep, to honour the sheep, to rule the sheep. Don't forget the word shepherd is not um, separated from that language of rule. Uh, and that's why you have in the New Testament the, the concept of ruling elders. Elders are actually those who rule. And whether you think in terms of presbyteroi or episcopoi, uh, you have this language of, um, of ruling uh, in terms of eldership at the level of um, older people, hence the word presbyteros, or of um, uh, episkopos, the one who has oversight, uh, regularly translated uh, as bishop, uh, and Jesus is referred to as episkopos in Hebrews, uh, in, um, in 1 Peter, where Jesus is the episkopos, but never translated bishop, noticed in any English translation, uh, normally the guardian of our souls. And episkopos is the one who epikopos, looking over, overseeing. Um, sometimes some bishops uh, rule, uh, they, uh, they, some, some bishops rule by oversight, some bishops rule by overlooking. Uh, and uh, d- depending upon how, on their, uh, uh, and some will mix them up and not know which one to use. So here we have this, um, uh, the, the, the concept here of past, what I, what I want to bring to your, to your mind here is that in the, the language of shepherd is a language of feeding, the language of caring for the sheep as God cares for his people. You see that with God's care for Israel. You see it at a human level with, with David caring for Israel as the shepherd of Israel. But you see it in the final exemplar of Christ caring for his sheep. And that then becomes the modus operandi for us as shepherds. You see the warnings you have with regard to uh, Ezekiel 34 and you have the warnings also with, um, in, in 1 Peter. So let me just uh, pick that up for you there where he says in chapter 5, I exhort the elders among you, I know, the, um, the presbyteroi, the ones with leadership gifts, as a fellow elder, and as a witness of the sufferings of Christ. So here Peter puts himself in the same, in the same orbit, a fellow elder. Yes, he might be an apostle, but he has the same responsibility of leadership and, and, and uh, tending the sheep. And he says, and, and uh, as a partaker of the sufferings of Christ, as well as the partaker of the glory that is to be revealed, tend the flock of God, that is your charge. That's, that's the command. Tend the flock of Christ that is your charge. And he feels constrained to put in the negatives. What not to do. Not by constraint, but willingly. Not for shameful gain, but eagerly. Not as domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd is manifested, 
you will obtain the unfading crown of glory. If you read through 1 Peter, you'll see that same movement as we saw in Psalm 23 from the good to the evil to the glory. That sense in which, yes, you're, you're in Christ, but you're going to suffer in this world. And if we as leaders of God's people, we have to feed the sheep so that they're prepared for the suffering that will take place in the world. And we do this eagerly, uh, joyfully, and for the benefit of the sheep, because that is to the glory of God. One of the greatest dangers for any shepherd, and particularly in the Anglican system, because of uh, tenure that you have as vicars, is, is to dominate. And uh, I think that it would, it's a good thing for you to do to get feedback on your leadership from your people. It's not something I'd do a, a survey across the whole congregation necessarily, but ask some trusted people who will give you honest feedback about your leadership. Uh, as you know, in a Myers-Briggs world, uh, you might come into different personalities uh, with, with regard to whether you're an introvert or extrovert and, uh, and, and all those characteristics of Myers-Briggs. There are other psychological, there's the, the DISC system as well, you may know these things. Uh, you'll all have, there'll be different leadership styles. But there is one common feature, are you tending the flock? And to tend the flock is not only to feed it, but to guide it. It's not only just to, to fatten them up, but to guide them to be the people of God that God has called them to be, to exercise their gifts in the world so they might be fruitful to the glory of God. That's the, that's the task that we have as leaders. And that because the Bible tells us the danger of domination, likewise with husbands, uh, lately uh, the complementarian view of marriage has been under threat because of the evil of domestic violence. And so some commentators are saying, well, uh, domestic violence is the product of complementarianism, uh, which I think is foolish, but it is the product of a wrong view of complementarianism or a wrong view of egalitarianism even, where the husband will dominate the wife. And domination is not servant leadership. Being a vicar or a pastor of God's people is, does not give you the right to dominate You've got to work out, how do I exercise loving leadership, that steel hand and the velvet glove, as Rick referred to? How do I do that so that I actually exemplify and model Christ in the way in which I handle people? Uh, you do it with your own children, don't you? When you need to discipline your children, you also know you need to give them a hug. They need to know that they're loved by you through the discipline. And that exhortation in um, Hebrews, what father does not love his son whom he does not discipline? God does that with us. The discipline of love is the discipline of Christian leadership. But it is such a knife edge, isn't it? And it's, you'll be criticised even when you're doing right. But when you're criticised for doing wrong, then have the courage to repent of the wrong you've been doing, if you've been dominating and not being that true shepherd, because that's not what Christ has called us to. Um, I was going to go to the ordinal, uh, but I'm looking at my time and see that I've probably taken more time than Rick wants to take and give to me. But anyhow, I think we're quarter past ten is where we're breaking, aren't we? Is that right? Good. Okay. Um, in the ordinal... Um, that's the passage in the prayer book for ordination. Just, to <laughs> just so we all knew what we're on the same page. Um, to the priest or the presbyter, uh, these words are used to feed and provide for the Lord's family, to seek for Christ's sheep that are dispersed abroad. You'll notice that language is picking up Ezekiel 34 in the positive rather than the negative turning the negatives of Ezekiel 34 into the positives. Uh, bishops are to be pastors uh, and doctors, interestingly. 
Uh, that's not doctrine in the medical sense, uh, but doctrine in terms of, of, uh, of teachers. Be to the flock of Christ a shepherd and not a wolf. So Cranmer understood the language of shepherding in terms of both the, uh, the priestly office as well as in the Episcopal office. Um, and, uh, and I think, and the two go together. A, a, a bishop in our system, of course, has a different kind of oversight for the flock. So, uh, Rick has responsibility over the whole diocese with regard to that. Your responsibility is basically within your parish. And, uh, your responsibility is to feed that, that flock there. And, uh, and Rick has, has different responsibilities, although he's still basically a pastor. And notice, and there the word pastor, shepherd, uh, is actually there in the ordinal, uh, d- despite that. Let me um, finally c- come to um, uh, word and sacrament. Uh, the, the language of word and sacrament is a common term. It's a Reformation uh, a term uh, with regard to both Luther and Calvin and Cranmer uh, as well uh, saw that the, the ministry of, um, of Christian leadership is a ministry of word and sacrament. And the language of sacrament there is, is, the, is the language of sign. Reformation, of course, uh, reduced the so-called seven sacraments um, to, the, to the two dominical sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper. And we're going to be looking at these through the week anyway. So I won't, I won't uh, spend a lot of time there. But what I do want to do is just refer you to, in Acts chapter 20, to that uh, classic uh, farewell of Paul to the uh, Ephesian elders. It's classic for a number of reasons. It interestingly it interchanges the use of episkopos and presbyteros. So we have discussion with your Presbyterian brethren. You can say it's all right. We understand episkopos and presbyteros do mean the same in the New Testament. Uh, that's fine. Uh, the language of a of bishop in the Anglican Church, just to help you if you ever wondered about this, if it was really biblical, the language of bishop actually applies to the ministry of Timothy and Titus. Uh, Timothy and Titus are not apostles in succession to Paul, but they are what we might call apostolic delegates. You'll notice the only qualifications for um, uh, elders and deacons come in the letters to Timothy and Titus because they're having the responsibility of ordaining and carrying on the succession of the ministry to the next generation once Paul leaves. Uh, that's, that's a very significant feature if you haven't noticed that. In the, in the, so Timothy and Titus are Paul's apostolic delegates and they are the uh, precursors of what you might call bishop in the ancient church. So you get your elders and deacons and your bishop. Uh, the real problem was that they chose a word which meant the same as elders in the New Testament. And so you have this awful confusion with regard to uh, presbyter and episkopos, which are clearly the, s- the same word, mean the same thing but just different characteristics, and apostolic delegate. But they chose one of these to refer to the, if you like, that, that, that third order, um, which has made life confusing. Like the word priest is confusing because it's confused with a sacrificial offering priest. And Cranmer discussed, looked at that, and he went, he went as an academic with etymology because priest means prester. Uh, Presta was the Anglo-Saxon word, uh, Presta coming from presbyter, therefore priest really meant presbyter. But history has proved him wrong in my experience. Uh, so in Sydney we tend to use the word presbyter. Um, interesting, the Presbyterians use the word Presbyterian, but they don't call their ministers presbyters. I, I've never understood that either. Uh, but anyhow, and uh, the uh, Roman Catholics call their vicarage or rectory a presbytery. So... It's a strange world we live in in terms of language, but nonetheless, uh, that's, the, that's the concept. But let me, but let me come back to you here. Um, in, in chapter uh, 20, he talks about the gospel of the grace of God. He talks about, I do not shrink from declaring to you, this is verse 27, Acts 20, declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Take heed to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you bishops, episcopoi. Guardians. Notice that it's God who's made you a leader. It's not ultimately the bishop who laid hands on you. It's the Holy Spirit. He's the one who's made you guardians, overseers of your people. And he's the one, therefore, to whom you must give account. Feed 
the church of God, the church of the Lord, which he obtained with his own blood. That is the significance of the ministry that you exercise. Your pastoral ministry is caring for those for whom Christ died. You must never neglect that and never forget that you've got a divine commission to care for God's people, to care for his flock. To do so, knowing that God has, has enabled you and, in, and, and helps you to find those lost sheep. As the ordinal says, to look for Christ's sheep scattered abroad, those sheep for whom Christ has died, who are not yet part of your flock, you ought to go out and find them. And by evangelising and bringing the gospel, God's elect will come in. There's work for us to do as shepherds. We're not to be passive, but to be active, because God has given that commission. The sacrament, and I'll talk more about that, not now, is really a visible word. It, it, it expresses what the reality is of the baptism of cleansing and the Lord's Supper of feeding and drinking on Christ. And that is, both of those are seen in the way in which the word of God changes us from within by his spirit so that um, uh, a person made in God's image might be redeemed from their sin and brought close to the, uh, to the Lord Jesus and given the inheritance of heaven and the forgiveness of sins, which is our great privilege to exercise as servants of God and shepherds of God's sheep. I'm going to stop there and I make it 10.15. Um, there's going to be group discussion. How do you want to handle this next bit? Is that right? In our group time, uh, really, uh, like any teaching moment when I'm doing it with other people, I ask people when they go away to group time to think about the pastoral implications of what they've heard for themselves. So um, you've been doing this a long time. You know how to apply things to yourselves. In your groups, what I want you to do is think about the pastoral implications of what Glenn has taught us this morning for you uh, in your own situation and for each other. Um, so I want you to spend some time reflecting pastorally on that. Um, so there aren't really too many guides, but um, for you, just um, yeah, discuss discuss the things that Glenn has said and think about the pastoral applications um, close to home for you. Um, you may actually reflect on that, and you might want to say to your group, you know what, I'm actually not sure that I'm, I think I'm a bit more dominant and domineering than I ought to be. Would you pray for me that I actually not lord it over people like the Gentiles do? Um, you may actually be somebody who doesn't, in fact, give significant, clear rule when it comes to the role that you have or even know how necessarily you ought to do that. And you may discuss that in your group as well. Um, but pick up the things that Glenn has shared with us um, spend some time thinking about pastoral application for yourselves and then take some time to pray and then um, we'll gather again here after morning tea at 11.15 so there's bound to be a clock watcher in your group and right on 10.45 you say I'm going to morning tea, anyone coming? Um, and away you'll go, alright? And then we'll be back here at 11.15 and we'll be looking at marriage not baptism um, and uh, and after that we'll have some comments from the ACL guys as well or perhaps a little forum of questions uh, to be asked at that point. Okay, so I think that's um, where we're heading. Um, could I suggest you find a group you feel comfortable in? No, you, you're pretty good at doing that. Maybe groups of six, uh, seven, something like that and go out of this building because... Um, what Alan wants to do is he wants to open up all the doors and without people in here give the birds ample opportunity to uh, go away in the politest possible way I put it. Okay, is everybody clear? All right, um, go and find somewhere to sit outside and Alan I'll leave you to lock, open the doors and... St
That'd be good. Thanks, mate. Sure. Yeah, great. Very good. Right. Sure. Yeah, of course you can.